This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Story Beat episodes are available at storybeat.net and on all major podcast apps and platforms. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to leave us a rating or review? And please subscribe to Story Beat wherever you listen to podcasts. My guest today is someone you've assuredly seen many times on the silver screen. Actor Troy Evans' four-decade career has been marked by a few memorable home runs and a huge number of base hits. He's guest starred on over 100 TV episodes, and you may remember him as Sgt. Pepper on the TV series China Beach, or Artie on the historic series Life Goes On, or from his 129-episode run as the desk clerk Frank Martin on ER. Troy currently plays homicide detective Johnson, a.k.a. Barrel, on the Amazon series Bosch. Troy can also be seen in over 50 movies, including playing the ill-fated Roger Podactor in Ace Ventura Pet Detective, or in Phenomenon, Under Siege, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Frighteners, and many more. Occasionally, Troy performs his one-man evening of stories called Troy Evans' Montana Tales and Other Badass Business. So for all those reasons, and many more, it's a truly great thrill for me to welcome the prolific actor Troy Evans to Story Beat today. Troy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, so let's go back and look at your history a little bit. Uh, You started as really no actor at all. You started in in the military in Vietnam, correct? I started life as a political junkie. My grandfather... Troy Evans, was a state senator in Montana. Oh, is that so right? I was intensely interested in politics. I can remember listening to the uh, 1956 Republican National Convention on one of those big stand-up wooden radios in the living room. That's right. I was, so I was eight years old, and I formed a plan, uh, and what my plan was, was I was going to be the first person in my family to go to college, and I was going to, going to become an attorney, and I was going to go to the state legislature, and from the state legislature, I was <laughs> going to uh, become the governor of Montana, then the senator from Montana, and then the first president from a western state. And how'd that work out? Well, you know, it was going <laughs> swimmingly, and I, I have my, my uh, high school annual from 1966, and there are a number of people in a row, Troy, please remember me when you're president. I was, I was going to do it. And then I started school in Missoula in 66, fall of 66, at the University of Montana, was drafted that following spring, went to Vietnam. And when I came back, I was a distinctly different person, although I was quite vividly unaware of it. And uh, rather than going back to school, I opened a a rock and roll bar up in northwest Montana. A saloon, yeah? A saloon, yes, the powder keg. And and, uh, the reason I did that was they were lowering the drinking age from 21 to 18. Right. And so on the day they they dropped that drinking age. I opened my bar, the powder keg, and it was the only rock and roll bar for like a hundred mile radius. And it was aptly named. It was a (laughs) wild, wild experience. But it turns out that owning a bar is not a particularly good profession for an estreporous alcoholic, (laughs) which is what I was. And uh, you know, there, there are always problems in saloons, and whenever there was a problem, I solved it with violence, which I'd learned in the military. And I am going to guess that you also were able to observe many characters. 
Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was an amazing, wonderful place, but it was extremely unhealthy for me. One uh, colorful occasion, uh, a guy got rude with a woman in the bar, and I responded by breaking both his legs. Oh, and uh, hauling them up and throwing them out in the street in front of the bar. And that gentleman was an attorney. <laughs> so what I was accustomed to was going over and seeing the justice of the peace and getting a stern lecture and a hundred dollar fine. Mm -hmm. And instead, in this case, I got a 40 year sentence in Montana. Oh, State oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, and just as a little il illustration for you, I, I, I assume you're aware on some level, when you've really been drunk, and I was drunk like 24 hours a day for two or three years, mm. uh, you don't sober up over the weekend. You no. know, it takes a while for those cobwebs to clear. So about six months later, I was sitting in my cell down in uh, uh, Rancho Deluxe. You ever see the movie Rancho Deluxe? Yes. That's, that's the slang term for Montana State Prison, which was built in 1860. Uh, and I'm sitting there and uh, I went, oh my God, I bet I'm not going to be Preston now. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I start thinking, well, what am I going to do? Well, I couldn't go back in the military. I couldn't own a bar anymore. Couldn't be a teacher. Couldn't be a lawyer. What the hell am I going to do? And and a few days later, I thought, I'll bet nobody ever asks an actor if he's had a felony. <laughs> no, no. In fact, that, it's a it, in fact it's a it's a badge of honor. And and I I I sent what they call a kite in the prison system to the warden, asking for a copy of Hamlet. Wow. And I still have that in my possession, stamped in the in the front, permission to have in his cell, Hamlet. Agent, and, you know, the inmate Evans. Permission why, Evans. why did you choose Hamlet of all the millions of plays or Shakespeare plays even, but how, why that particular play? Well, it's one I, I was aware of. That's what big actors did. They did Hamlet. So let's read that. So it was because it was a familiar name to you. Yes. Yeah. That's very interesting. Well, of course, now after the bar being in prison, even more characters. Yes. So, yes. so you have had a crash course in all sorts of interesting humans by that time. In fact, I, I, do you want to hear a, a, a quick uh, prison story? Absolutely. Kind of, okay, two guys are in this story. One is a guy who called himself Patty Duke. I have no <laughs> idea why. But, and everybody knew him as Patty Duke. And there's another guy named Scooter Bob Cronabush, who was what we called in the prison system, a double bad motherfucker. Oh man. So, and this is in a cell block that was built in the uh, 19th century. You know, it's, it's five tiers of cells uh, sitting inside a big cement room. Like you've seen in the old movies, a brick room with like 15 feet on each side. And you just sit like, a, it's like a bird cage. You're all sitting in there. And, uh, Patty Duke is down on the bottom and Scooter Bob is up on tier five and about four o'clock one morning, Scooter Bob starts yelling, Hey, Patty Duke, Patty Duke, <laughs> Patty Duke. And then the, the time honored, he's banging on the bars with his tin cup. Yeah. Bang, 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 bang. Patty Duke, Patty Duke. And so we're all, oh, geez. so 15 minutes later, finally from down to the bottom here, this is Patty Duke. What? And Scooter Bob said, Patty Duke, you know that lie I told you yesterday? That might be the truth. <laughs> 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 and to show you that I have absolutely no judgment, about 25 years ago, I was on a set with Patty Duke. <laughs> and I <laughs> couldn't help myself. I told her that story at lunch. And then she she stopped talking. To me. <laughs> she never talked to you again. <laughs> so to be clear, Pat, the Patty Duke from prison was not the same Patty Duke from the it's set. Not the same Patty Duke, <laughs> and the and the real Patty Duke had no idea why this guy with that story was standing next to her on the set. <laughs> no, she probably went home and increased her security. <laughs> <laughs> and and obviously and had no. Uh, she's quite baffled by the whole experience. So, <laughs> All anyway. right. So, so you've now read Hamlet in prison. 
Uh -huh. So we're going to talk about how you get onto a career here. Uh, okay. you, you read Hamlet in prison, and something must have sparked in you. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, I as you could probably discern from what I, uh, what I told you earlier about my plans when I was eight years old to become president, I never, I've never had any problem believing I could do whatever I decided I wanted. So once I decided I was going to be an actor, then I was just going to be an actor. And to fill in a big hole in this story, there was some kind of bizarre improprieties in my sentencing. I actually had gone through a, an alcohol program at the Veterans Hospital. There's a big mental hospital down in Sheridan, Wyoming, and came back and I had a deal with the prosecuting attorney to get a six-year suspended sentence and then came in to get sentenced and instead the judge gave me the 40 years. And then even the prosecuting attorney objected and explained, no, you're supposed to get six years suspended. So the judge called me back and he didn't, he said, I'm going to revise the sentence. So I sentenced the defendant to 40 years hard labor plus six years suspended. So now oh. I have 46 years. Oh. Well, it turns out that this guy, <laughs> whose name was W.W. Leslie, had run for office three times in Silver Bowl County, which is Butte, Montana, tough place. And all three times, he'd been beaten by the same guy. Troy Evans. Troy Evans. Oh. My grandfather. Good Lord. And when I came up in front of him, he just shoved it right where the sun didn't shine. Oh, my so goodness. So because of that, the oddity in the sentencing, it went to a sentencing commission. And in about two years, it worked through and they kicked me loose. Uh, so two years is a lot better than 46 years. I, I would say so. I would say. And, and here's the odd thing. All that time, my family and myself, we all felt that this was just a disaster and was destroying my life and was, but the fact is I'm totally convinced now that if he hadn't sent me to prison, I'd be dead now. That's because nothing else would have gotten the message in strongly enough that I'm one of those guys. I cannot drink. I can't have one drink a night. I can't have one drink a year. I can't touch it. And I, now it's been, I've been like 46 years or 48 years sober, something like that. Well, Since 72, whatever that is, 48 that's, years. That's really, that's really remarkable and admirable. Yeah. Uh, it's of course not the purpose of the show, but I'm curious, did you do that on your own or did you go to AA or what did you Well, do? for a while I was going to AA, was court ordered and that. And the fact is, I'm just, I'm not a meeting kind of guy. And there, and, and I'm, I don't want to disparage AA in any way. It, you know, it's helped millions of people stay Indeed. straight Indeed. and sober. However, in my case, th their basic tenet of that thing of every day, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay sober today. I just decided uh, in the early 70s, I don't want to make this decision every day. I don't want to have my life be about getting up every day and going, I'm not going to drink today. I, I am not going to drink again, ever, period. If I get to where I feel that I have to have a drink, I'll just shoot myself in the head because that's a quick trip, you know? And that's, that freed my mind. I've never had to make that decision again because I know I'm not going to do that. Well, I can tell you from just being in the business that you've been in all this time, that the fact that you have that kind of willpower and that determination has stood you very well in the business, has it not? Yeah, well, and uh, uh, not to belabor it too much, but I think there are a lot of people who are casual drinkers. If you stuck them in that cage up in Montana for two years, they might reconsider, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it was, a, it was strong medicine. It, well, so, in your case, it worked very well. You know? Yeah, well, so then I, I got out. I went uh, to school on uh, my parole plan and went to, to Bozeman in the theater department. And of course, you know, so now I'm like a 25, 26 year old military veteran, ex-con. And of course, these college theater productions, all the other guys are 18, 19 year old guys sure, coming sure. in from Wolf Point, you know. And so I got lots of good casting. And uh, did you have a rough edge to you at that point? 
Oh, yeah. You had a rough edge because you'd been in the military, you'd been in Vietnam, you'd been in prison, you'd owned a bar, you'd been an alcoholic, and all at that point, you must have been fairly rough around the edges. Yes. In, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll jump ahead in the story just a little bit. At the end of that year, I went down to Berkeley, California, because I had an old girlfriend there on spring break. And I saw posters for auditions for a place called Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts. PCPA. PCPA. So I thought there were some summer theaters in Montana that were highly esteemed in those areas. And I thought that I would go to one of those theaters that summer. So I thought this was a great opportunity for me to practice my audition pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and so, you know, PCPA, do you know uh, Donovan Marley? I've never met him, but I certainly yeah. know of him. You know, and and uh, here was this guy who, completely unbeknownst to me, was a powerhouse in the theater world in big, California. Big time. And I, I had no intention of, you know, I was at Montana State University. I wasn't going to go to some junior college in the <laughs> summer, you know. But uh, I thought I'd go and try my pieces, so I did. Uh, that nice speech, the opening of the matchmaker, and then I did Hotspur from Henry Four Part One. My liege, I did deny no prisoners. That that speech, which I wish to God I had some tape of that. I'll bet that was <laughs> so <laughs> over the top. We both be. I finish, and there's Donovan, and he had a, an accompanist with him, a, a guy I also know, Bruce Seavey, and. Uh, Donovan just looked at me. He said, well, he said, that's, uh, that's interesting. He said, what's your song? I said, oh, oh, I, I, I don't sing. He said, it, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be a prepared song. Uh, he said, just a little happy birthday or anything, just so I can get an idea of your pitch and your, your timber. And I said, maybe you didn't hear me, pal. <laughs> I said, I don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked over, and the accompanist is looking at me like, <laughs> like Hitler's in the room, you know. And I'm like, but I didn't care. I had no intention of working for this guy. And then I got back to Montana, and he sent me a contract. And I was lucky. I knew one guy who was teaching uh, at Hartnell College in Salinas. And so I called him and said, you know, this guy, Donovan Marley, sent me a contract. And he said, if Donovan Marley offered you a job, you have to take it. You have to take that job. Indeed. And this goes to something you mentioned earlier. My entire professional and personal life has flowed out of the three years I spent at PCPA. Yeah. It was one of those magical uh, ER. China Beach, uh, Bosch, 1976, there was a, an actor in Santa Maria named Mark Harrier, and he had a friend from Oregon uh, named Eric Overmeyer, who was a young playwright who came, sure. by, came through to see the plays, and I, I met Eric there in 1976, and now, what's this... 40 some years later, he's executive producer on Bosch and I'm doing the, a wonderful, you know, a wonderful job. Crate and Barrel is just a dream at the end of my career. You know? I, I want the listeners to pay attention to what Troy just said, which is very important. And I say this to my students all the time. I've been teaching for quite some time. And this is very important. The people who you come up with in the beginning parts of your career frequently are the people who you remain friends with and you should remain friends with and as their careers rise sometimes you get dragged along into this that or the other thing and that can be very instrumental in the success of your career and so that's what you're talking about when you were Absolutely. PCPA did you work with an actor named John Daly that was probably after your time yeah, uh, I don't recall but I'm very bad with names so but, he, but. he's been on he's been on this show he's a dear friend of mine he's a, a journeyman actor he's been working his whole life in theater he's made a career out of the theater not out of movies or TV which, which is a whole trick unto itself, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, all right, so let's talk about some of the, the business part of, of what you do. After you were at PCPA, you then what, started to audition for TV shows and movies and that kind of thing? Oh, well, uh, at PCPA, uh, one of the things that Donovan did, 
was he hired really good directors from just what you were referring to from the regional theaters. Right. So like uh, uh, Nagel Jackson from Milwaukee Rep and uh, uh, Stan Wojewodzki from Center Stage Baltimore and people from from Seattle and people from uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Jim, Jim Dunn, who always directed the show at the Oregon Shakespeare. Those people would come in. So in the course of doing 30 or 40 shows at PCPA, I met a bunch of these people, and then I started getting jobs at uh, Arizona and, you know, all, all over the country. Stage and jobs. Stage, stage jobs, and, which was wonderful. And then when I didn't have a stage job, I'd come back to Hollywood and start and bang my head into the wall there. <laughs> and so, and then when I got a theater job, I'd go do it, and then I'd come back and, and do what they call equity waiver in LA, which is uh, if you're in a theater of un under a hundred seats, you can work for free, you know, right. which everyone wants to do. <laughs> everyone wants to work for free for some strange reason. I did a lot of equity waiver theater in my time in LA. I yeah. Know, I know it well. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so you so, started to do theater in LA so that you'd also be seen by casting directors. Yes. Yes. And right uh, to your point, I came down here. There's an actor named Greg Itson. Greg Itson was sure. Emmy nominated as the president on 24. Sure, sure. A wonderful actor and a really prime theater actor as well. And he got me in with a group of, he was, uh, had been at, at PCPA, but he also had gone through the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. And they had an active group of theater actors. They would put on their own productions here in LA and, these waiver productions. So he got me in a couple of those plays and uh, which goes to your point of the people, not just the people directing, the people sitting next to you in the green room. Everybody. The people, yeah. So, and then he also, because he was in the play, then his agent, a guy named Dick Lovell uh, came to see the play. And then I was able to get signed by Dick Lovell and Dick Lovell, a uh, wonderful, amazing guy, he specialized in under fives. And uh, I'm sure you know what an under five is for your audience. It's a role five lines or less. Exactly. And, and so I was, I was actually making a living being, you know, the third cop through the door. Hold it. You know, or, or uh, uh, I was on soap as the bailiff. All rise. <laughs> two words you paying know the, but, paying the bills but you would you would always you you would always work and incidentally i was in and, and a lot of agents like to do this they like to pitch you for a job if you're in the office they'll call somebody up and and pitch you for a job to sort of show off for you so he's trying to get me a, an audition with a, a casting director who didn't know who i was and, and and Dick said, "Oh, oh, you know Troy, a stocky guy, short hair, sounds like a man talking through a duck." <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> sounds like a man talking through a duck. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. He also, you know, I I I, I had a, a, a friend named Will Ute, who is another one of these theater friends, who was also in the Dick Lovell stable. And he did that painful thing actors have to do where he goes, he set up a meeting with Dick to explain to him he wanted to do bigger parts. <laughs> and he figured out the perfect way to do it. Gets in, Dick says, well, what's on your mind, Will? And Will said, well, Dick, the, the thing I would like you to understand is I would like to be successful enough that I make you a millionaire. And Dick said, Will, I don't need the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a clue <laughs> yeah where do you go where do you go from there <laughs> no, okay <laughs> go home <laughs> you also you know and i'm saying this as a compliment you have a specific look you have a certain face you which you have exploited for your whole career not everybody's going to have what you have and that's something you couldn't help you were born with it but but it is a memorable you have a memorable face if you see troy evans once in a movie or tv show you remember it's that guy you know oh well that's a nice thing to say you know i, I think of it 
as uh, uh, being the executive vice president of the Lumpy Faced Guys Club. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, there's that group of actors, and it's a sad thing, right, that this doesn't happen now because of the COVID. But there are about 50 or 75 guys who I've been sort of friends with now for over 40 years because every few weeks we go somewhere and there's out of that 75, there's 12 or 15 of us in the room. And one of us is going to be the sheriff, you know? <laughs> sure. And, and, uh, and you know, there's just, uh, and I, I call it the lumpy face guys club. And, and, you know, there's, there's a funny addendum to that. that uh, you know, a lot of the jobs I've done, you look at, the list long list on imdb a lot of those were like one day on a movie 32 years ago you know right. i never saw the movie i don't remember the I, movie i understand but, the problem <laughs> but then also i i, I get stopped uh, on the street and somebody, oh, and they'll and they'll be going on about this movie and so i have to explain to them about the lumpy face guys club and i i'm not trying to be rude to you but you know i'm not in that that movie and that's you know there's it's one of these other guys who's you know and but then i'm curious so i go home and look the movie up and it, no i'm i'm in the movie, in the movie. <laughs> well I, I will tell you a related story to that which is I, i've got 90 or so teleplay credits almost all of it's in animation and and you write an animation script and off it goes through the mill and you don't see it for another nine months or a year if you ever see it and in fact any number of of scripts that I've written, I've never seen. I've never seen the finished product. So people will do the same thing to me. They'll say, oh, you know, you wrote blah, blah, blah. And I'll go, did I? And I have uh, to go check my credits. And so yeah. I, I understand the problem. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. It's the same. It's the same thing. Plus, I imagine in that, the, the name may have changed three or four times. And, and that's also happened to me that movies that I made, they're out under a different name. Different title. Yeah. Sure. And if you were on it for one day, why would you necessarily remember it, especially if it's uh, not a real uh, spectacular part of some kind, uh, you know? Yeah. Now, 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 do you want to hear a, a, a one day job story? Sure. Let's hear a one day job story because you've made a, a career out of one day jobs, although you've this, gone beyond that. This was the first movie that I was ever in. I'd done TV shows, but I got hired to be Mr. Oshkanagan the cheese truck driver on planes, trains, and automobiles. And I got the job and this wouldn't happen today. I went in, I, I mean, it's a part, the part wasn't actually scripted. It was a, like the, the guy with the cheese truck picks up the uh, candy and uh, Steve, Steve Martin, Martin. Yeah. Uh, hitchhiking and, uh, and there was room to ad lib, you know, that, that was the part. And, but I met with John Hughes, which today, I, I mean, you, if you're doing a second lead in a movie, you don't meet with the director. You know, you're taped somewhere. And you're, but I go in, and, and he explained the situation to me. He's picking these guys up, and, and he makes them ride in the, in the trailer. He won't let them in the truck. Uh, and what I remembered in that moment, there's an old plumber's joke, you know, which is, it might be shit to you, but it's bread and butter to me, <laughs> right? So uh, he said, you know, if you want to ad lib something. So, so we, I did this little thing with John Hughes where I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll give you guys a lift. I'll let you ride in the back of the trailer back there. But you be careful back there. That might be cheese to you, but it's bread and butter to me, pal. <laughs> and John Hughes thought that was wonderful. So I get hired, and Heather and I were in a little... Uh, apartment in the mid Wilshire. Our rent was three hundred and ten dollars, and we didn't have it. And uh, Dick Lovell called me and said they're they're hiring me for planes, trains, and automobiles. One day, a thousand dollars. And at that time, I was I think scale was two twenty five. You know, I'm thinking a thousand dollars. That's that that's three months' rent. You know, oh my God. So I was so you know I was so happy about it. And, and then uh, he called back and said, well, uh, they decided they're going to shoot this in Buffalo, New York. I said, so, so, I, I, so I lose the job? He said, no, 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 you, you'll still do it. And I'm thinking, well, how the hell am I going to get to Buffalo, New York? I was totally green, you know. By the time I go to Buffalo, New York, I've spent the $1,000, you know. It's like, right. hey, he explained, no, they pay you for a day to go out and the day you work and they pay you for the day to go back. 
well, what do they pay me? A thousand dollars. Oh my God. So I'm like, I'm making three thousand dollars to say this one line I made up. So they fly me to Buffalo, New York, and I get in a hotel, and then a teamster comes to the door with a hundred and fifty dollars. And I'm like, hey, 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 something what I don't know what's going on here. I'm supposed to be getting a thousand dollars a day. He said, This is your per diem. I had no idea. I'd never heard of per diem. I didn't know what per diem was. He explained to me, it's your spending money. I'm like, holy shit, I get spending money. You know? So I'm in Buffalo, New York, two weeks. And then they call me down to the production office and say, we're moving the production to Chicago. So once again, I think I'm out of a job. I think, so I, I go back to LA and say, no, 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 you'll go with us. So two weeks in Buffalo, a couple of weeks in Chicago, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, Kansas City, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Quail Hollow, Ohio, 11 different cities, 51 freaking days. Oh. <laughs> I started this movie. We didn't have our $310 rent. And when I went home, having finally said my one line in the movie, we bought a house. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's when I knew I'm never leaving this business. <laughs> but now the irony of that is I've never made that much money on any other movie. <laughs> Normally, a, a normal movie job for me is, you know, making around six, six grand a week and I get five or six weeks on the movie. You know? mm -hmm. But I've never made $50,000 on another movie. But, but once you're on a TV series, that's a different story, right? That's steady. Uh, that's well uh, actually the only series i've ever been a regular on was china beach and on er i was hired separately at top of show 129 times that's amazing it, that they yeah. wouldn't figure out at some point let's get troy in here and do a deal you know yeah well they had the deal they wanted they could, and well, and and you know the the reason I got on ER to begin with was Abe Ben Ruby, who was playing the desk clerk, had held out for more money and they cut him dead. You know, so <laughs> he left. He left for a couple of years and then they brought him back. M meanwhile, so, you had, you had established yourself. Yes, and I'm sure you know what what top of show is for for benefits of your of your listeners. That's a, a an amount that's negotiated by the union that's what seasoned performers get instead of getting union scale which might be three thousand they make six thousand right. dollars it's it's minute. a hot it's a higher number and it's sort of favored nations with the other top of show right and on er they hired me at top of show but every year it goes up a little bit but they wouldn't even bump me up to the current which was wasn't a lot of money it was a matter of two or three hundred dollars Right. At the end, when I'd been there for, for nine years, I wasn't making top of show anymore. The guy who came in and did one episode was making more than me because I was making what was top of show when I came on the show. Uh, and this is another thing for your students. And I, I got pretty agitated about that at some point. And my wife, who is wonderful, uh, explained it to me. She said, Troy, you're right. You're getting fucked. But if you're going to get fucked... This is the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it beats the hell out of uh, prison in Montana. Yes, that license plate factory paid hardly at all. Man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I want to ask you a couple of questions about your process as an actor. You've okay. auditioned many times for parts, I assume. What's your philosophy toward auditioning? How do you look at auditions? This is actually, uh, I believe, a phrase from George Bernard Shaw: "Light." and easy and steady and certain nice and the other thing and i think this has saved my life and it's involuntary i don't know if you could do this when i leave an audition i completely forget it you have to I, dismiss it from your mind yes just completely and i've i've had uh, several jobs over the years where the agents have called up and said hey you got that movie i'm like what movie and they have to explain to me, yeah, you remember, you know, two days ago you went in and read for, oh, oh, yeah. But 
I, I think it's a, a defense my brain has developed that I don't agonize over. All right, so go, go back a half a step. That was nice. What was the phrase? Nice and easy? Uh, nice and easy, steady and certain. And, and what does that mean? Light, light and easy. Light, light and, and easy. easy. Steady and certain. certain. Got it. And so what does that mean in terms of what you're doing? You're not putting anything on it that's stressful. Is that the idea? Uh, um, for want of a, of a better way to say it, it's just rather than going in over the top, it's coming in a little bit underneath it and just let the material carry you. Don't go in like when I was talking about auditioning with Hotspur, that, mm -hmm. you know, my liege, I did deny no prisoners, but I remember, you know. No. <laughs> you know, take the, take that angry scene and take it, take it down. To do it. My liege, I did deny no prisoners, but I remember when the fight was done. Oh, that's but, very good. You know, How long did it take you to figure that out? How many auditions or years had you been at it before you went, aha? Uh -huh. Well... Uh, the place where I really figured it out was where we started this at PCPA, mm -hmm. where Donovan hired, uh, the, the way that theater worked is he had really top-notch theater directors, and then he would hire a core of artists and residents of 12 or 15 top professional actors, and then uh, about 100 uh, student actors, of which I was in that club my, my first year. And... I was fortunate enough to recognize when I got there that some of these guys knew a lot more than I, you know, I went down there thinking I was the pro. Sure. And, and, uh, and actually, uh, you know, you were talking about the little, uh, the little, ang little cuts in the road. I was so sure that I was top drawer and I was a little bit defensive about going to this junior college and I'm driving from Montana to spend the summer for six hundred dollars down in in Santa Maria, California, and I'm thinking, and he's going to have, he's got all these little buddies, and they'll be doing the good parts, and they'll be, and I, I knew that they had some actors coming from this ACT in San Francisco, yep. and so the night before I had to report to Santa Maria was also the last night of. Uh, did you ever see uh, Bill Balls Taming of the Shrew, the Commedia dell'arte Taming of the Shrew? I did. It's not. on. It's on film. Uh, PBS filmed it. And so uh, I knew about that. And so I stopped in San Francisco and said, I'll go see what these guys think they're doing, you know, and went in that beautiful Geary Theater, 3,500 seat theater, packed to the gills. And they started the show with the traditional, the 10 minute dumb show before Taming of the Shrew. And by the time that was over, I was so humiliated that I had thought that I could go on stage with these people. And then the play, and have you ever been in that position where you're embarrassed? You think that people somehow knew what you'd been thinking? You know, I just wanted to crawl under my chair. I was just shaking when everybody else left the theater and I was just sitting in that chair going, I can't go down there. I can't, I, how, how do I go down there and audition in front of people like this? Well, and, you were, you were I, at, the, you were at a very beginning part of your career. Yeah. And so I, if I hadn't stopped there, I would have gone to Santa Maria with this arrogant attitude. And instead I went with completely flipped. I was like, well, maybe I can just, you know, I'll get some spear carrier parts and I can be on stage with these guys and I'll learn. So I went there with the idea, I'm going to find out what these guys know. You lay in the weeds and you observed and you decided to absorb the information rather than be the, the giver of information. You were the learner of information. Yes. And then uh, that, that summer, I, I got actually really nice casting, you know, supporting parts in, in three different plays, and all three of them were shoulder to shoulder. Do you know a wonderful actor named Mike Winters? Uh, no, I don't know. Primarily, primarily a theater actor, but uh, uh, he's, he's done some television, but not a lot. And he's just a sublime actor. He lives in, in Seattle now. Uh, you know, it was just, it was a master's class that whole, that whole summer and uh, uh, sort of set the stage. You, for you are a theatrically trained 
actor. You didn't start in movies and TV. You ha have a solid foundation in how acting is supposed to, to be put together. When you receive a script, especially where you have a nice, healthy bunch of lines to say in a day's worth of work or a week's worth of work, and you start to look at that script, or if you go do your one-man show, or if you're doing a theatrical piece somewhere, what is your first step with a script? What do you do? You've been, you now have the screenplay or the play, whatever it is, aside from reading it, what's the first thing that you do? Oh, what I do is I just read it and reread it and reread it. And particularly my scenes, I just read them over and over and let them just seep into my brain. So is so that it, how you memorize lines by doing that? Yes. Yeah. So it's a, a, a perpetual repetition of reading, which yeah. sounds a little bit like Anthony Hopkins, who claims that he will read a script as many as a hundred times before he's ready to actually proceed. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's what he says. He will read it a hundred times. And so that way he knows all the parts. He knows whatever he's going to say and do. And that's what you do. Similarly, you just read and read and read so that it, you what you absorb it and and i yes and i want to thank that's probably the only time in my life anyone will ever compare me to anthony hopkins but i'll take it <laughs> i'll take it well you're both actors yeah. yep. <laughs> that's close enough so your preparation then is not to do some kind of deep dive in research or anything like that it's to read and read and read or do you do research well did you have to research your first cop or did you already know what you were doing well, I had, I, had, I had some pretty good idea about that. You know, when I was a young man, I was on the police athletic league uh, boxing team up in Kalispell, Montana. Mm -hmm. And so, and it was a small town. And I've uh, been, uh, been friends with the, uh, you know, I have, even while I was a convict, I had friends who were cops. Sure. Uh, and, you know, much of my, uh, of my career has odd, it's odd playing cops. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little, a very brief little story I find amusing. I have a, a brother who uh, is a wonderful gentleman, Clive Foster Evans, lives up in Northwest Montana now. And he uh, spent his life in the corrections department in the, in the state of Washington. And when he retired, he was like the number two or three guy in the, in the state of Washington in their overall corrections department right he and i are our look is very similar and uh recently in a phone conversation uh he said yeah he said you know uh when uh when we go out to eat uh frequently people mistake me for a felon <laughs> <laughs> What? People think that the felons are all eating with the cops? <laughs> <laughs> no, they just think he looks like that guy who's on TV who he happens to know oh, is a felon. Uh, so they, they mistake yeah. him for you. Um, all right, so I'm curious about your experience with directors, great directors. You've worked with lots and lots and lots of directors, both TV and film, and some of them spectacularly well-known and many not. Um, what have you learned from the great directors that you uh, – are able to then use repetitively in your work. What kind of information do you gain from great direction? Um, Ernest Dickerson, I, I've gotten to know on Bosch. And that's the closest uh, that I, I mean, there are a lot of directors I've worked with that I, that I like and, and respect. But Ernest, his theory of how to direct a scene uh, comes closest to my theory of how to do one. And, that is, Ernest lets it happen. Okay. He, uh, I, I notice this, I, I, it's, just, it's a beautiful thing to watch uh, because he directs almost subliminally that he'll, he'll bring the actors in. And, you know, a lot of times now with directors, they don't even rehearse. They just sort of place people and then we start, you know, then they start rolling. And he comes in and says, let's, let's read through it. And he, he'll just have us go through it two or three times. And as that happens, people naturally and organically move where they would be if they were talking to that person. And it, and it starts to take its own shape as opposed to him saying, yeah, I want you, you're coming in from the hallway and uh, uh, Troy, uh, just be here in this chair. And then when he gets to there, you stand up. 
he just sees how all that he just lets that create itself so so he hasn't staged anything first he's letting right. you sort of dictate a bit of the staging if not most of it right right <laughs> and and you know he has an overall understanding of the scene if something isn't really working he'll say well you know what let's you know he'll let's tr let's try this instead of being there come from here but he lets it have its own life to begin with does uh, does he wait till he's done that before he places cameras or does he place the camera oh, yeah. he waits until he's done that first yes and then the and cameras then, come in because he knows where he wants to put the camera yes. at that point yes that, that that's and, a very uh, interesting way to do it and so what you learn from him i'm assuming is to let the actors organically find it yes yes and it's not a lengthy process you know, you're working with good actors. We understand the, and, and the difference of, of the tenor. Like if I'm shouting at somebody, I don't have to be right up next to him. But if we're, you know, I'm talking to Titus and I have an aside to my partner, great. You know, there, there are certain things that are dictated by the script. And they, if you just do a loose rehearsal like that, it'll reveal itself. I, I imagine it's also quite helpful when you've been on a series for a while and you know each other intimately in terms of what you're going to do. Oh, very much so. Very so, much so. so when you're on a show and you're on, you have a nice part, but it's your only time on the show is that episode. You're having to step onto their moving train and you've got to figure out how they work. That's right. Depending on the show, that can, that can be a problem. So I want to get to the opposite question, which is you go onto a show and don't name any names and either the director is not doing a great job or is not paying any attention to you at all, or you're getting direction you're confused by or doesn't make any sense or something like that. What do you do? How do you handle it? What's your methodology for solving that issue? It, it actually hasn't happened very often. Well, that's good to know. In the cases where it has, uh, what generally works for me is, is what, what works for teenagers, which is I, totally agree with the director and then do what I want. And <laughs> usually he likes it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're absolutely. And I've, and I've actually gone so far as to do that, to have something I want to do. And I'll, I'll go to him and say, you know, uh, your suggestion that I start this on the other side of the door is, is really good. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, <laughs> which they've never made any such suggestion, but since I'm agreeing with them, they go with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit like you'd rather ask forgiveness than permission. You're, yes. you're going to just do what you're going to do, even though you've now agreed wholeheartedly with the direction that you didn't understand or doesn't work for you. Right. And nine times, if not higher, 99 out of 100 times, they go, that's great. Move on, right? Yes. Yeah, because all they want is for the scene to work. Sure. You know, and if, if the scene's working, then they're... Then they're well, my, my assumption is it's pretty rare in your career at this point for you to be on a stage with actors who don't know what they're doing. You're working with really seasoned professionals yes. almost all the time. And have you been watching Bosch? Have you seen I, Bosch? I've seen a couple episodes, but I have okay. not been watching it regularly. Okay. Well, ER was one thing. I went through the other day, I, I got on IMDb and started going through the actors who were, who were on IMDb. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much a list of the membership of the Screen Actors Guild. If yeah, you sure. had a, if you had a card, you were on ER. Some oh, point, sure. you know? they, they, they ran them through. It was one of those shows that had millions yeah. of people on it. And, uh, and, you know, and they didn't allow any duplication. Like you couldn't be the, the cab driver this year and two years later you come back and you're the guy who fell down on the sidewalk. And a big ensemble show, lots of yes. different, different scenes, different people. Uh, but, but the cast was 99% of the time the cast was, was really good. And where I'm going with this is this show Bosch. It's just amazing. Every single actor is, is just aces. Top drawer. It's, it's just top drawer. And, and, you know, every part, every guy, the, the guys you're talking about who come in, they just have one day. They're great. It's just, and this Jamie Hector, do you know Jamie Hector uh, from The Wire? Sure. And he, he plays Bosch's partner. And, uh, oh, my God, he's a great actor. So just, how, how helpful is that to you as an actor, to have great actors opposite you? 
Oh, oh, well, it's enormous. It's, you know, everything, everybody rises, you know, the better it gets. And, and Titus is a very generous actor, possibly the best number one on a call sheet I've ever been around for that in terms of working with the other actors, not working above the other actors mm-hmm, as the series mm-hmm. lead. He, he comes in there as, a, as the actor who's playing Bosch. Right. You know, not as the king of the world. Well, he's been around for a long time too. To yes. Well it. And, and he is, he's what I think of as smooth. He's a really smooth actor. Yes. He's very meticulous. What do you uh, mean? In what way? I, I mean, probably more so than, than I am. He's really thought about everything in every scene. So his choices are, are all based on some thought process. That's, you know, he's, it's not random or willy nilly. He's really thought through what he's going to do. Yes, that's what I'm. That's and, what then, I'm and then I'm assuming this is an assumption on my part, totally, that the the classic sense of uh, being in the moment comes from being that well prepared. Yes, yes, absolutely, because he's he's totally comfortable in it, and uh, and you know, uh, there's another way that that uh, benefits the show without anybody from, from, from the pilot on, without anyone having to say it, it was clear if the guy who has pages and pages of dialogue mm-hmm. comes in at six o'clock in the morning and he's got it and he's ready to go and the first take is good, you better not drag your tired ass in there with three lines and not be able to do them. No kidding. You better come ready. No kidding. You know, I, and that's accrued to the show. Everybody is on board. Well, it's, a, you know, the movie business, uh, one of the key phrases is time is money. And you don't want anybody to drag that down because it gets super expensive and people get ticked off. So yeah. you have to know your stuff. I mean, the, the yeah. legend of all legends, of course, is Clint Eastwood sets in which you better know your lines when you walk in the door or you're in big trouble. Right, right. <laughs> There's, uh, he expects you to know it and have it. There's no question about it. I, I, have you seen that clip of Tom Tom Hanks talking about about Eastwood on uh, and, during uh, as Sully Sullenberger? Uh, yes, and he and he says uh, that if for for one thing, Eastwood doesn't say action. No, no. He goes well, go on, and then they'll they'll go on. They'll they'll do the scene. The cameras, and then Clint Eastwood will say, "That's enough of that." <laughs> and that's it. He that's it. never never says action or cut. And the and the story goes that he learned that doing rawhide when they would yell action, the horses would bolt. So uh-huh. so that's why he he never does it. He he always says okay whenever you're ready or that's enough of that shit. <laughs> he yeah. just moves on from there. Um, so I'm curious. We're talking about set life. Uh, you've been on tons of sets. What is it about sets that you find appealing? Oh, the camaraderie, the the sense of, of being surrounded by, I you know, I, it isn't just the cast. I love the crews. I love uh, being there and seeing all those people who are so good at their job. Oh, no kidding. You know, and I'll, I'll give you another example from Bosch, a, s- a small one of it. The, when we did the pilot, we shot in the uh, Hollywood police station. Okay. And uh, on, with, on, uh, on Wilcox, that police yes, station? Yes. Mm-hmm. And then we came back to do season one. We were down on Red Studios, which is down near Melrose and Vine. Down right. There. It was, you know, it was Chaplin Studios and then it was Desilu Studios. Now it's Red Studios. Right. You know, Red is a camera company. Yes. And so they, uh, my understanding is the people who shoot on that lot get a break on the cost of the lot and the cost of the cameras. Oh, well, there you go. It, uh, and, and they built that police station, the, the, you know, the, uh, the detective's room. And it was so perfect that we had some cops come in to visit, and one of, one of the cops started to faint, to phasal out, because he knew he wasn't at Hollywood Police Station but he was at Hollywood police station and his brain, he started to fall really? because it was like, wait, wait a minute. Uh, you know what, that thing where you, you suddenly don't know what's going on. You're it in- was that, it was, it's that, you know, down to the post-its on the wall, the every, everything was duplicated. And, uh, and that's, that's just, 
an, an example of the, the high level of skill of the crew. He was having a slight out of body experience of some yes. sort. Yeah. Right, so, so sets are also notoriously distracting places. There's a lot of activity between shots and there's a lot going on and, and things can be very distracting. What do you do to remain focused? What kind of technique do you use to stay in where you need to be? Just simply just focus on my own business and, and, and focus on, on what I'm, you know, what I'm supposed to be focused on and let other people focus on what they're, on the work they're doing. And, you know, it links to something else. And I, I know you're a teacher and I know you've taught this and I just want to reinforce it. The most important thing you can do is listen. Oh, that's everything. You have to listen. And I, I've, I've got a, a couple of things I want to say about that. Number one, this actor that I mentioned, this Jamie Hector, mm -hmm. uh, I have an expression. I say, nobody listens like Jamie listens. Mm. And on set or off set, if you start talking to Jamie Hector, he listens to you with, with such intensity, he starts to suck your body into his brain. <laughs> You know, and, and it's not an act. It's like if, if he's taking the time to listen, he's going to listen. Yeah. And it, I'm and playing this comp, it works so beautifully. It reminds me of the best thing anyone has ever said to me about acting. And uh, the great Charles Durning, who I never, I never had the opportunity to work with him, but we were friendly because we we're both infantry veterans. Right. Uh, he said, if you ain't listening, Ain't nobody listening. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, people forget. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, that, that's a spectacular quote. People forget that there are, they conflate the two words, hearing and listening. Hearing is automatic. If, you, if you're not deaf, which most people are not, you hear. You hear whether you want to hear or not. Things are coming at you and you're hearing it. But listening is an action. You actively have to listen, and the great the great actors are great listeners. Oh, oh, absolutely! Yeah, I, it, it's uh, I, I don't think it's possible to to be even a good actor if if you're not a listener. Uh, I uh, I think without it, there is nothing. I think Charles Durning's quote is extremely apt and very very good. Um, uh, all right, so I'm curious, do you prefer? to work movies, TV, or the stage. Do you prefer to work on the stage? Is it more fun for you in a way, or is it harder? Or what, what are the big differences for you between stage and film acting? I, I went through a, a change on this. You know, I grew up as a stage actor, and most stage actors will tell you that they would far prefer to do the stage. And I felt that way for quite a while. And then that gradually shifted. And now I haven't really done a play for at least 25 years. Oh, I'm not wow. sure how long. And there are a couple reasons for that. Number Money. one, Money. yeah, I do this, I do this for a living. Mm -hmm. And number two, when I show up on a TV or a movie set, 99% of the time, the cast and crew and director assume that I know what I'm doing and they allow me space to do that job, maybe with a suggestion here or there. And I get to go in and basically fulfill what my vision was of that part. Right. 99% of the time. In the theater, it doesn't matter how seasoned you are. From day one, the director thinks it's his job to pick you apart every day and give you a mountain of notes and suggest, well, let's just try this. And you've got six weeks of coming every and doing it this way and doing it that way and he gives you a bunch of notes and you go home that night and you come back the next day and do what he asked you to do. And now he thinks uh, that it's stupid and it's somehow your fault. And I just got tired of it. And I would much rather go to the set, do the job and come home and be done with it. You, you want to be treated like a professional in that way. You know what you're doing. You're going to, you're yes. going to come. They've, they've hired you for a reason. It's because you're you. Yes. And, and you're the best you that there is. There's no other you like you. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's, th that sort of boils it down. So uh, I doubt that I'll ever do another play. And, and I'm full of admiration for my actor friends who still do it and love doing it, but um, it's not for me. All right. So 
I, my imagination tells me with all of your credits that you have not spent a ton of your career without work. Though right now we're having this conversation in the time of COVID. And my assumption is, is that you've had a little bit of downtime, but this was enforced downtime. It wasn't because your career was on pause. It was because the whole industry was on pause. I'm curious about what your, what your philosophy is to being between jobs. How do you handle between gigs? Well, you know, it's gotten much easier as I've gotten older and, and I have a, a little bit of financial security. Right. And uh, I think when I was younger, you know, as a general rule, I, I worked steadily over the last 40 years. But there were probably a couple of different years where I had a year where I didn't work. You know, or, and, and or, how did you handle that? How did you psychologically handle it? How, what did you do to keep your chops up? What did you do? Well, I'm sure in those, it, that's kind of a, a fuzzy memory now, but I'm sh pretty sure uh, that then the, the only thing I really had that I could do in those days was uh, uh, go do a play, you know, get in a equity waiver play or, or do or leave town, go to you know go go to Arizona and do a play, reach out to one of those people, then then that's how how we we survived. And uh, you know it's a funny thing, and this this is something that young young actors will learn on their own eventually. There's no way to put a science to it. During that uh, nine years I was on ER, I do ten or eleven episodes of ER every year but I was still getting three or four or five other jobs each of those years. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd go out. So, and then ER ended. And so I thought, well, we're going to have to tighten the belt a little bit here because I'm going to have to live on those, that handful of other jobs. Right. And when ER ended, those jobs stopped too. And so I had like three years in the, you know, in the early part of this century, uh, like 2009 to on through 12, 13, something like that, uh, where I just didn't work at all. But I was retirement age. I was, I had residual income coming in and, uh, and I just figured, well, it's the end of my career. And then out of the blue, uh, uh, Bosch pops up. And now I've done like 60 episodes of Bosch. For first, this is six years now, seven years. Uh, we're working on on season seven. By the way, you made references. We we just finished a week ago, episode four, and then Tuesday I was supposed to work on episode five, and they shut down because somebody got sick. Uh, somebody went to a Halloween party and got oh. COVID. I don't know who. Some well, actor. I, I, I still have lots of friends in both movie and TV industry and in the theater. And the theater is really in trouble because nobody's doing theater. At least you're able to sort of do yeah. some set work. But yes. theater, theater is shut down and it's really frustrating for a lot of people. I, so you don't do anything special anymore in terms of um, studies or acting classes or anything like that? No, I... Uh, I'll tell you what, what my life is. I'm first of all, and I love telling people this. My wife uh, is a blacksmith. T tell everybody your, who your wife is. My wife is Heather Ann McClarty. You can find her. Uh, her website is uh, steelcrazy.biz. <laughs> uh, and I thought of the name. I'm very proud of it. Steel Crazy. After all these years, after all no. these years, <laughs> steel crazy dot B I Z. And you'll see, she does beautiful, uh, handcrafted metalwork. Mm. But we met, we were talking about the, the way your, your theater life affects your, you know, the people you meet. I met her in Santa Maria, 1978. She was in the prop shop and we've been together for 42 years now. Well, you know, it, again, it's that the links in the chain of life. You don't really understand it until you get down the road a ways and are able to look back and see how one yeah. link is attached to the next link. But for a long time, the beginning part of your life and career, you're just going. And then suddenly you realize there are connections to everything. And it, it becomes a beautiful thing to look back and see how it all 
sort of stepping stone its way toward a whole life and a career. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's just, it's just amazing. And uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, and the, the thread is, and, and I, you know, I'm in contact every day with people from that, from my earliest uh, theater days. And that's, we're back to that lesson, which I think is still a, uh, we've already said it once, but it is valuable to repeat it. Keep, it's very important that you be nice to the people on the way up. That's the old phrase, be nice to everyone on the way up so that you are still seeing them on the way back down and that they help you make your career grow. Yes. And I, I, I just want to reinforce you because what you have said is almost verbatim. What I remember that first day I sat down in the theater in Santa Maria in 1976, and this guy, Donovan Marley, got up, and there was 250 people sitting in that theater, and he was addressing us as the, the company assembled for that summer. He said, this is where you will meet the people who will affect your career for the rest of your life. He said, he said, and they're not up here with me. Right. They're sitting on your left and on your right. Right. And he proved to be correct, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Including By the way, I'm still in contact with him. He's just uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful human being. And uh, the the list of, of people who, who went through his program and, and went on to greatness, you know, it's pretty amazing. Well, and one person, one teacher, one director yes. can influence a huge number of people. Yes, and, absolutely. And it's amazing when that happens. We've heard all these great stories. So I hope you have one more for us. Uh, something that has happened to you in your career. Can you share anything that was either strange, weird, quirky, offbeat, or just plain funny? Not that we haven't already heard a bunch of that. I'll tell you one from back early in my career. I just started working in, in, uh, in Hollywood. And uh, my sister, uh, who lived up in Seattle, my older sister, uh, Lexi, came down to visit Heather and I. And we picked her up at uh, Burbank Airport uh, in my uh, 1950 Studebaker. It was, a, <laughs> it was a, a beauty. And we went to Old Town Pasadena directly from the airport because that, that was a nice area with outdoor restaurants and stuff where we could go. Sure. And, uh, you know, I wanted to give my sister the best experience that, that I could on her visit down here. And we uh, got out of the car. And as I was putting money in the meter, uh, like a eight or nine year old girl came running up to me with a piece of paper and asked me if I'd sign it. And it was so right there in front of my big sister and my wife. And it was so, and I took it and I, I wanted to write something on it for her. I said, uh, I, I'm curious. I said, do you know me like from Hannah Montana or what? She said, I'm on a scavenger hunt and I need a signature from somebody over 200 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> now well, that, that's a deflated ego right there i'll tell you well so much for your impressing your sister <laughs> oh that's yeah. hilarious it's wonderful isn't it and and i have to tell you then my my interest was peaked i i said uh, i'm happy to sign it for you i said how much how much do you think I weigh? And she said, 201 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I, she's probably at the UN now. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you do get stopped on the street more than a few times, don't you? Yes, yes. People and recognize you. As, as one of my friends says, you know, Troy uh, talks to people. <laughs> and I, I love that. You know, somebody wants to take the time. I'll, I'll tell you another little little story. This is, I came out of the cafe that's about a mile from us down on, on, uh, on North Figueroa here in, in the Highland Park part of LA. And uh, I generally pretty nice to homeless people that there was a guy out there and he was one of those guys who was so filthy that you couldn't tell uh, what his race was. You know, mm -hmm. he was just this mess of and and he had a cart full of just trash and he smelled so god awful. I couldn't even go near him to give him a 
a dollar or something, you know, it was just, and I, I f felt terrible, but he, he's calling to me and I turn, I'm walking away and he started yelling, Hey, 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 please. Hey. So I stopped, I turned around I said, uh, what is it, pal? He said, why did Noah Wiley leave ER? <laughs> I'm going, where does this guy watch TV? You know? <laughs> oh my God. And expect you to know the answer to all yeah. that. That's well, hilarious. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. last last question for you today, Troy. And you've already shared bunches of this too. Can you lend for those who are starting out in the business or maybe you're in a little bit trying to get to the next level, a solid piece of advice or a tip that they can take with them? Uh, yeah, well, this might be helpful. It, it's, uh, I think it's important to remember, uh, and I've told myself this a number of times, nobody else ever got my job, mm. you know? If Dick really got it, if Mike Winters got it, if Mike Reagan got it, it's their job. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't take anything from me. That wasn't my job. And no matter how much I wanted it, it's their job. So move on and find my job. That's a, that is such solid advice because a lot of the job that you do is psychologically not worrying about the fact that you didn't get the gig. Right. Yeah. Say so, yeah. now, uh, now, do you have time? Do you want to sure. hear, hear, hear a little, little story about an audition? Absolutely. Uh, this is going back maybe 20 years, and I got an audition for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Right. And it was for this spectacular part. He was a 500-pound, 6,000-year-old lizard man. <laughs> and someone had... Uh, put a curse on him thousands of years ago and turned him into this hideous lizard. And he'd spent all his time planning the destruction of the earth in, uh, in vengeance. And, and the part was Shakespearean. He was, uh, he had a, a magnificent rage about him. And it was just, I, I was such, I really wanted the part. I really worked on it and, and I can do rage. You know? So <laughs> no, I, no so doubt. I, so I got over to the uh, to the audition, and I'm I'm uh, I'm always a little early, and I go in, and the casting director came in and stopped and talked to me. He said, "Oh, Troy, I, I'm so glad you could make it. So I've, I've tried to get you in, and you're always so busy." I could, and then this part came up, and they called and they said you could come in, and I'm oh, I'm so excited to see you. Thank you. Well, that's that's pretty nice, you know. And then this other guy comes by, and he stops. He says, "I don't know if you remember me, but..." Um, I directed uh, an episode of uh, of China Beach, and uh, and uh, so glad to see you're auditioning. And look, 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 so he goes in, and then I'm, I'm still working on the thing. And then three guys come by, and they say, "You don't know us, but we're we're the producer, and we we worked on Life Goes On, and uh, we've always just loved you so much, and uh, look forward to seeing." I'm like holy shit! So then they go in the in in the room. And then it's about 45 minutes, nothing happens. And the, and meanwhile, the green room is filling up with actors. There's about 30 or 40 actors in there and they're not seeing anybody. And then they came out, they said, Troy. And I went in and they said, Troy, we're so sorry uh, that we took so long, but we got in here. We started telling Troy Evans stories and we just got carried away. We've been laughing, going, is it? So I told a couple of, as you can tell, I, I've got a couple of stories. Sure. You know, and, and we're laughing, we're having a good, and then I do my audition, and it's the rage scene. And you know those carnival rides where you stand against the wall and the thing spins and yeah. the floor drops out? Sure. It was like that. Watch those people in the room as I'm doing this, and they're just like pinned back against the wall. And I finish, and it's everybody's uh, uh, hugs all around and going. And uh, as I've indicated, I never assume I have the job. Right. I leave and, and forget about it. Like, but in this case, I couldn't imagine that I didn't have the job. It, I, I, that, that never entered my brain. So usually by, you know, you audition in the morning and then by four or five that afternoon, the, the offer didn't come the next day, the next day. Now I'm thinking, well, maybe they pushed the episode back or something, you know? And another thing I do not do, 
I don't call the agent. If I don't get a job, I don't call the agent and say, find out why I didn't get that, whatever it was. Because, mm -hmm. you know, why would I want my agent calling up a casting director? Well, he stunk up the room, you know. He came in, his audition was terrible. Why, why would I want, you know, <laughs> there's a reason they didn't hire me. So, but in this case, I called him, could you just check on that Buffy and see, see what's going on with that? And he called me back about 10 minutes later. He said, Troy, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 5,000 year old lizard man. I said, yeah. He said, they, they, they loved you. They, they loved you. But the executive producer uh, felt they needed to go a little younger. <laughs> a five thousand year old. Man. I was too old. <laughs> too old. <laughs> True story. Well, that <laughs> those that's a great Hollywood story because that that happens to so many people where they think they've got whatever and they find out they didn't get it, which they were perfect for anyway. So yeah, that's oh hilarious. yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, Troy Evans, this has been just so much fun on StoryBeat today. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing all these wonderful oh, stories. Oh, it's my me. honor to be here. You're, you're so good. Oh, well, thank uh, you. I, I feel like I've talked to an old friend for an hour. I've, actually, I feel like I've talked to an old friend for 10 minutes. Well, but they're going to cast somebody younger. Yes. <laughs> that would be a hoot. <laughs> Go listen to it. And, you, and, and you've dubbed in Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> Is he available? <laughs> yes, yes, but you have to make him talk through a duck. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Groucho Marx, or actually G Chico Marx, why a duck? <laughs> <laughs> yes, why a duck? Oh. Troy, thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Have a beautiful day. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.